Let's go ahead and get started this morning with Grand Rounds. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Christy Biolois uh, from the Department of Surgery in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Uh, Dr. Biolois is an assistant professor. Uh, she grew up in Pennsylvania uh, in a small town. I thought I knew a lot about geography in the United States, but today I learned there's Philadelphia, there's Pittsburgh, and everything in between is called Pennsylvania. Okay. Didn't know that before. Um, she went ahead and did her uh, undergraduate at Cornell uh, Medical School at Jefferson in Philadelphia, uh, and then her general surgery residency at Mammoth in New York City, and then did her plastic surgery fellowship uh, here. Uh, she's been on the faculty here uh, for the past uh, four years, uh, quite productive, very active clinically, helping multiple uh, divisions and departments get their uh, wounds closed, and this morning she's going to talk about the Abra device, or as we affectionately know it, Abracadabra. Dr. Bialois. So, hi everybody. Um, just for those of you who have worked with me, thank you for helping me when I'm in the OR. It really helps to have extra hands, and if any residents or other students are around and they see I'm doing a big abdomen, I'm always happy to have the extra hands for that. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Abra device, mainly because there's a lot of questions um, about what can it do, what is it good for, when should you use it, when you shouldn't use it, and I think it's over the last few years actually been very helpful in closing some very difficult abdomens. Every picture in this talk except for one is a patient of mine that I've done here. I, th I think at this point now I'm at seven abdomens that we've done with this. Everyone but one had been closed all primarily. One which you'll see why it wasn't closed primarily was still closed and he has a nice strong rigid abdomen anyway. So this is something as general surgeons can be used um, with or without a separation um, technique. So if you're stuck somewhere and you don't have someone around to help you, it's actually pretty easy to place and to manage. Um, but you have to really know what you're doing because you can cause some problems. And apparently that doesn't work there, so let's try this one. Okay. So, PPG, what do you see? Right, so uh, exactly what he is talking about. This is a patient who 10 years ago, prior to this, this was the first one I ever did Abra on, had a perimesh abscess and infection that was a disaster. That whole pocket of air and fluid is actually the abscess above a layer of mesh that Dr. Serenik was involved with, with me. And yes, so it had nothing to do with his part. It had nothing to do with him to start with. Yes, um, but but he called me. It was a, it was a Christmas. Uh, yeah, it was the Gore-Tex one. This was around Christmas time a few years back, and he asked uh, at this at the point that I got involved with. I'll show you those pictures. He said, "Can you help me with this?" And I looked at him like I have no idea. Um, this abdomen was quite inflamed, as you can imagine. Being that it was ten years out, you the rectus muscles, you can't even really figure out where they are. Um, they're over to the side. You can kind of make out where the external oblique is, internal oblique is, but there's just a big space between any sort of muscul um, muscle that a separation would normally be used for. So after, at this point, I was talking to some of the other residents in, in general surgery. Zach Nash was one of them, and uh, Dr. Van Sickle had started to be playing around with the Abra device and said, how about we try this? And at the time, trying to get that in the hospital took about two weeks, but we were able to get it in. And from that, we've now become more streamlined in how we can get the Abra. So before the Abra, when you had a belly like this, this is what his belly looked like when I got to see him. That hole up top was for where IR had attempted to drain and temporize him. And uh, just looking at this, there's a large 35 centimeter gap between the rectus muscles, a large loss of domain, the abdominal wall is pretty rigid just from the chronic inflammation. What do you do? 
So in the past, there were Bogota bags, Whitman patches, especially for those patients that were unstable in traumas. And you would try to get them stabilized as best as possible, and then you want to get them a closed abdomen so they're not losing all their protein, that they're, they have a chance to start healing. So sometimes they could be, a vicral mesh could be placed on and then skin grafted over that when there's good granulation tissue or some variation of that. Also, using a VAC-assisted device such as Abthera is something more, free, more recent that we've started using as well. And while all these things are things that, yes, the patient's alive, yes, the patient hopefully doesn't have any draining wounds, it's not the best quality of life to follow that. And this is one of those ones where he was in a MVC, MVC and ruptured the right rectus muscle the attachment and he had a significant loss of domain. This is one of the worst ones I had seen where basically his entire bowel is in a sack, just skin graft. He couldn't do much, he could walk, but he couldn't really move, he couldn't do anything. You could see the, all the intestine moving around under that. And I mean, what type of quality of life did he have? So doing this type of thing, yes, again, you saved his life and you do have to make sure that they're gonna live no matter what you do. But there are things that now we can start wor trying to work on when they are stable or if they don't, if they come in more of an elective type basis. When you do those uh, different techniques to try to close it, there is a big loss of core strength because your muscle is not in the center. Muscle is splayed out to the side and it continues to get worse and worse over time. There is a ventral hernia associated with it and a small hernia is not a big deal. A big one like this is little bit more of a big deal. I don't know anyone who'd really want that, you know, to, to walk around with. And you will need extensive future surgery if you want to try to get that back inside the body. Um, and that isn't a simple task. And all those things aren't even, aren't successful all the time, but even with the Abra, nothing is successful 100% of the time. If you operate enough, you're going to have complications. They have a poor quality of life, they are often disabled, and they have a very poor self-image. And this is just another, ver um, this is his CAT scan where you can see there's just, there's a abdominal wall on one side and then there's just nothing. And this is at the pelvis. So when you talk about a separation, trying to get about a 20 centimeter closure, that's at the midline. Down towards the pelvis where you have bony stabilization, you're not gonna get a 20 centimeter closure. And with that, that's a lot bigger than a 20 centimeter closure is gonna ever get. So what do you do? So. Indications for why you would use an Abra would be a large, obviously a large abdominal wall defect. If it's simple to close, you don't need it. Um, it's an abdomen that's amenable, other, otherwise amenable to closure. If they're still septic, if they've got five fistulas, if they're not stable, you don't want to screw around with an ab Abra. An Abra is one of these things once you get in, it's a pain to really get it out. You can get it in, get it out, but it's not like an Abthera where you can just change it and then keep looking inside the bowel and make, running the bowel and making sure everything's okay. It's good for the frozen muscles, ones that are stiff from inflammation, but not stiff because they have a chunk of heterotopic ossification in them. So there's a chance that they can stretch, there's a chance that they can get closed, and all the ab is doing is allowing that stretch to go in reverse <coughs> of what the hernia or um, abdominal catastrophe had done. And the significant loss of domain, as you can tell, the top bowel's more fresh abdomen, the one the below is the one from that first guy where there was chronic inflammatory changes. If the bowel is out there and you can shove it back in, that's great, but if you peak pressure jumps up beyond 40, if they're gonna be ventilator dependent, if they're gonna start going through abdominal compartment syndrome, that's not gonna help them either. So sometimes the ABRA is good to just address the compartment, possible loss of domain and compartment syndrome that could happen until their abdomen has stretched well enough to then accommodate the bowel and then the swelling has gone down so they can accommodate the bowel and then you can close the muscle. So there's a lot of things that all go into it um, but nothing really new from any sort of training that you've had before. So again, this is not the Abthera. The Abthera is great and it is very useful, especially for going in for multiple washouts and getting them in there and make sure when you put it in that it's all the way under the fascia so that no, the bowel is not sticking to it. But it is not the Abthera because if you ask for the Abra, they'll try to give you the Abthera. If you ask for the Abthera, they'll try to give you the Abra. It's, they're two separate things. They're not even the same company. But 
you can use them together. Many of these patients will have the Abthera for about a week, give or take, as they're getting washed out, stabilized, <coughs> clean, closed, and that's fine, and that actually is great. Because again, like I said, the ABRA itself is not something that you can just change back and forth willy-nilly. When you get your ABRA and you open up this kit, you get all this crap. And there's actually an extension kit as well. You get a fenestrated silicone sheet, and this needs to be placed in um, the abdomen, not up and down like that. You actually have to go horizontally because you're trying to get between the fascia and the bowel all the way to the flanks and all the way around. They do not recommend cutting it at all. You just shove that sucker in and you can fold it over. Whatever you have to do to get it in is what they recommend. Um, the retainer is a big plastic tube with little <coughs> slots in it. Those slots are to help take your elastomers and make sure they're evenly spaced. The fish I found is pretty useless. It is small and I use malleables because when you have that nice, they call it the cannulator, but basically it's a big metal trocar. Um, you just put it in just like you would any laparoscopic five millimeter trocar. But it is, even though it's blunt at the end, it's still sharp enough that you can do some damage. So I do like to have a malleable because I'm gonna go fast and I just wanna get in and out. And what's nice is it's like a, anyone that actually has sewing, it's got a little hook and eye inside. So you can slide the elastomer through it and it will catch it and pull it up. When you're doing these changes and the patient has one rupture or something and you need to replace it, you don't have one of those, Carter Thompson works, but it's a bit more difficult and normally what we end up doing is put a little suture purse string around the elastomer and then use the Carter Thompson to pull it up. It doesn't work so well, so if you can try to get them in with the cannulator on its own, the first time, that's normally the best. They say it's it's not traumatic, but they are holes, and they are going through the skin and fascia and the muscles, so they do some damage. So you don't want to be hitting them and impaling them and impaling them and impaling them. They just will just destroy the muscle. The elastomers have these little hashtags on them. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have any extras of those that I could bring so you could play with them, but I'll show you, I'll describe how you actually put them in and what you have to be looking for. And then you have the button anchors and the button tails. And I do have those because there's a little trick to get those on so you can play with them afterwards if you want. Um, none of this is actually held on by any adhesives. They actually are just held on by the pressure of the elastomers pulling everything in. And then the button tails help just um, spread out that pressure to hopefully stop necrosis of the skin. But there are pressure necrosis issues depending on how much tension you're putting on them and how long you're doing this. So according to Abra's literature, um, in, and from what the reps have told me, I kind of ignore them sometimes because they say, hey, yeah, use Abra. You can use Abra 100% of the time. You can get it closed without doing anything else and you don't need a mesh closure. I have not been in any of these abdomens that have pristine fascia that look like they can really sustain a nice closure without any other assistance. Um, if they did, you guys wouldn't be calling me. Um, they say that with Abra, 80 to 90% of their cases that they have in their like four little papers that they talk about were closed with Abra alone. When they said, when they compared it to Abthera, Abthera alone is a 70% closure. Um, it was kind of weird. I was looking through their, uh, when I looked at their numbers, their average defect size was only 18 centimeters. That number alone is amenable to a separation. So in theory, you shouldn't need an Abra for that. Um, and that was the average defect size. There were many much smaller. So of course you're gonna be able with something that's dynamically allowing you to close, close it in about, in a few days. But even with that, they said 11 to 30% of them still developed a hernia. And a 30% hernia development seems a little bit high to me. Um, and they took up an average of 53 days for closure. My, at, at two weeks, is that's my cutoff. I will get you closed in two weeks or we're doing something else. And so far, everybody within two weeks, sometimes even if they're only a week, um, they're closed. Just because I don't like having a large open abdomen, again, loss of protein and loss of every, uh, the fluids. I'd rather have a closed abdomen with maybe a small planned ventral hernia um, over something that's gonna take 53 days. It just seems like, what are you doing for those 53 days that you couldn't get it closed? Maybe Abra wasn't the right choice. So the literature's kind of strange, but again, I'm 
as long as you use it right for the right patients, I think it's very good to, to do. So what do I get? What are the things that I tend to, to, to see? 35 cent plus centimeter defects is pretty normal, unfortunately. You can see there's a big chunk of something shiny up there that shouldn't be there. That is heterotopic ossification. Um, it happens in a lot of our trauma patients when there's been a lot of bony injury and those little cells go somewhere and they just start growing. It's sharp, it's not fun, it doesn't stretch, but it does hold the suture really well if you're trying to get them closed. Poorly controlled diabetics also. Um, in the ABRA studies, they weren't really these diabetics with glu blood glucoses in the 300s. Uh, 400s, horribly septic. These are the guys that kind of come to you guys in the first place and then come to me. Um, who do I think needs an ABRA? Again, a picture like this. This is another one showing that, now that's showing it's a 19 centimeter defect from one edge of the rectus muscle to the other. But you just seeing how much bowel is on the other side of that line, you know that trying to get that back inside is gonna have, have a massive loss of domain. And you're not gonna be able to stretch and close that just on its own. If you do, your peak pressure is gonna be over 40 with no problem at all. The patient's not gonna be happy with that. And you're gonna be monitoring every, every few minutes to make sure they don't have a compartment syndrome or they're just gonna pop everything you do. I mean, they, you're, that abdominal wall is really strong. It likes to be open. Once it's already retracted back, you have a lot of force trying to close it, along with all the fat. I mean, I don't know how many of you can see, but the, you know, here's the edge of the muscle and the bone. That's the edge of the skin. That's a large amount of fat that wants to die, pull off, just have a lot of uh, weight behind it that everything when they're laying down wants to go like this. So you got a lot of things against you when you're, you're using this. And that's why the Abra is good, because it is a dynamic closure device. Now, there are some patients that electively going into this you know are going to need it, and then there's the urgent ones. Um, once the damage control is completed and you have no further plan of really going back in and exploring the bowel or just taking one last peek, because when the silicone is placed inside, it actually starts making a capsule. So for us, when we put a breast implant in, it forms a nice capsule around it, and that capsule is just as connective tissue that Normally it's as thin as a balloon, but if it starts going crazy, it gets up to be like a grapefruit for the peel. Same thing happens around the bowel. The bowel starts to get this little capsule around it and it's encapsulated. So it's, it's great because then when you are closing later, it's not trying to jump out all over the place. But that means that you're not gonna be able to go back inside and see what's in there. Um, I have had some just concerns in the back of my head. Well, is this gonna cause some sort of obstruction later or something like that? Haven't seen it yet. The bowel seems to, it just seems to be more of a temporary thing that kind of takes care of itself later, but knock on wood, there's only been one person we've had to go back in and we snuck out on the side for an open gallbladder on that guy. Um, I don't remember how, I know it wasn't fun for you to go back in and do that, but it was still done. So how do you place this thing? Um, that's kind of the first thing. It's actually very easy. You do have to follow their numbers. The numbers are done on purpose. This is actually theirs. This is nice and pretty. I don't get such a nice abdomen because the rectus muscle isn't that far apart, so it's kind of interesting to me. But basically, you put the, the, the silicone sheet inside. It is fenestrated, so it does allow for fluid to come out. Then you're going to mark, starting at the top and going all the way down, five centimeters lateral to the fascial edge. And that's five centimeters lateral to good fascia. Don't use that stuff that's that stretched, um, like peritoneal, diastatic, whatever the heck it is. Make sure you get to the good edge of the fascia and make sure you're five centimeters back from that. Now, when you're doing that, that doesn't mean five centimeters from the skin edge because the skin edge might actually be more like you need to be 10 centimeters from the skin edge to be five centimeters away. And also, you have to remember the belly's round. So if you're going in this way, you've got to go perpendicular. So you've got to make sure that you've hit that. And the reason is because if you're only about a centimeter away, that pressure is gonna tear through it. You wanna give it time so that, you wanna give it space so that you aren't cutting through any of the muscle. And the space, the button's three centimeters apart. Now this one, they're a little bit farther apart. This is an older one, so the buttons are a little bit wider. The newer ones that you guys can play with, they're nice and square and rectangular. The reason why it's three centimeters is because if you put a hole pretty much 
here and here, and there's a little bit of space, that's about three centimeters. Anything closer, they're gonna overlap. And anything farther away, you're not gonna get the maximum stretch that you need to actually help close everything. So you need to go above the defect as high as you can and below the defect as low as you can. And you don't start closing it. Some people are, te are tempted to say, hey, now the rectus muscle down below and the top is closable, so I'm just gonna put a few stitches in and keep going. They don't recommend doing that. Um, I guess in theory it's because then you're, not, you're still not having that extra elastic dynamic closure at the bottom. You're now just closed it. Maybe that's why they say it. I never got a good answer from the rep as to why not to do it, but I just follow the rules and it seems to work pretty well. So once you get it in, what are you gonna? What do you have to do? So you're like, yay, it's in, great. Um, the elastomers, this is the best picture I could find after I've taken out with the actual black marks that you can see. So these little marks are on every one. So you put them in first, and then what you're supposed to do is do this move maneuver, which is an osteopathic code. It actually does have a code in the, the books where you're kind of squeeze in and hold and advance that up the abdominal wall. It sounds weird, sounds like voodoo, but it actually does help with a few centimeters of closure, at least initially, and each time to help kind of align all the, the fi muscle fibers. <clears throat> After you do that, you pull the elastomers on each side, and they'll just tighten, they'll hold within this little piece in the center of the, this uh, button, and it'll lock in place there. And you're pulling to get that black mark twice the length as the um, unexpanded mark. So if you just have the tail of the elastomer hanging out and it's relaxed, you want the black mark on the inside of the abdomen to be twice that length. And that gives it the, for the, the force needed that's not stretched too much. You're not going to snap those elastomers, but that you're actually going to get some uh, dynamic closure on it. Now, troubleshooting with this. Um, the, again, these pictures are all patients that have had Abra and it's worked. What if the torso is too long? Well, they do have the extension kits, and I always want an extension kit in on my patients because the, those, as I showed you, that silicone sheet that's up and down that actually goes horizontal. You don't want to go the other way. You got to make sure that all that bowel stays inside. It doesn't poke up. It doesn't see because you're when you're done with this, the abdomen is not really closed. If that bowel sneaks out, it's going to be out. It's going to be exposed, and that's not going to be fun. The extension kit includes an extra silicone sheet, which you can push right on top of it. Now, they've suggested, that, well, how do you do it? Do you overlap it? They don't recommend overlapping it. They recommend cutting it and sewing it together. Sewing, I try to figure out which suture is going to be less irritating to the bowel and just find that. And it doesn't have to be super tight. You just have to be close enough that no bowel is going to sneak up inside that again. And what if the torso is too short? So what do you do then? just fold just like it would along the side you just fold it to kind of get underneath and if it folds over on itself that's apparently okay um, and I haven't had any problems with that part so what do you do when you get a patient like this this patient's had multiple fistulas they've got an endostomy there's a 25 centimeter fascial defect there's some other holes from other stuff because she's had multiple surgeries before she even got to us well, if the fistulas are controlled and they've been repaired and the anastomosis is okay, then that's good. The ostomy, well, you can't do much about the ostomy. You just got to work around it. The defect, well, 25 centimeter defect, all my patients I do a separation on. The, whether or not I do it at the time of Abra or after I'm done with the Abra just varies on how sick is the patient when I'm working on them. How, much, how have they been doing? Like if it was 10 hours of lysis of adhesion and a bunch of enterotomies, I'm not gonna be screwing around for another hour and a half trying to get everything else in. I'm gonna get them in and out with the Abra. So what you do around the ostomy is you actually double up the elastomers. So on the right side of the abdomen, you place all those buttons the same way, but around the ostomy, you wanna be a few centimeters apart on each side and each one will then go, one of the ones on the normal side will double up to two here and two on the other side, the ostomy. And you have to be a little bit careful because with the ostomy, sometimes the bowel sneak in this way or that way. You don't want to put a trocar through that. And you don't want to kink it in any way. It does potentially cause some kinking. 
So you just have to be very careful of how you're positioning it. And you might not get as much of an aggressive closure around the ostomy as you want, but it does work. It does tend to also give more pressure necrosis at those two points because with two elastomers, that's twice the pressure you're getting. So you have to be very mindful of what, how that skin is behaving. And sometimes I'll get these guys closed, try to be more aggressive, get them closed sooner and deal with a small little wound defect then take an extra week on top of it while I'm slowly screwing around with it because then other buttons are gonna start causing some pressure necrosis. So adding a wound back to it is pretty much the standard. Um, they did initially a while back recommend that you don't really have to, but it helps address all that fluid because again, it's fenestrated uh, silicone. The vac goes on top of it. It helps prevent the skin from falling back it takes care of all the fluid that is being produced. Um, the, the, of note in their studies, they said that anything that uses an epithera, now again, this is not an epithera, this is just a regular wound back, but using epithera before the abra has a high rate of failure. Well, yeah, but if you're needing the epithera, there's a problem with the patient. I mean, they're not this happy person who walked in with a small defect, they've got problems. So of course, they're gonna have a little bit higher risk of failure when you're doing the epithera, the abra, and a wound back on top of it. Now, early on, I didn't really know, what do you do with the sponge? Just stick it on, do you put adaptic, do you put tell, whatever, what do you want? They had no good answer. I've actually just now moved down to just put the wound back directly on it, and it's been fine. The fenestrations in the silicone are small enough that it doesn't have any damage on the bowel, the bowel isn't getting sucked up or anything. The wound back does help keep the skin closed, and often it will look like this, like this. the skin's completely closed, and would be closable, but the muscle edges are still out to the sides. So the patients feel better, because like, oh look, my valley's closed. And it's really not, but it makes them psychologically happier about that. Um, now, <coughs> then in, in theory, you can change this thing at the bedside. Um, I guess with, in the ICU, if you have sedation available, it can be done. I have yet to find anyone who's awake really want to take me up on that. So we end up going back to the OR. So this does mean you're buying yourself, going back to the OR every two days, sometimes three if it's over a weekend, you can't get OR time, and tightening them. And what's, what you're doing is just changing the wound back in general, and then you do the move maneuver. You start at the bottom, move it up, hold it every 10 seconds, and then tighten, starting with the top, the elastomers to get back to that stretch. So again, it should be about the twice the, um, with of the black marks. Now, I'm very aggressive, and I don't care if the skin falls apart, because I'll fix it later. So I normally crank the heck out of them and will accept the skin problems that may take an extra month or two to heal later, but again, they have a closed abdomen, so they're normally pretty happy about that. So this is that patient that we saw with the ostomy. This is what the wound back looked like at first, and the picture before, um, and we'll show later on what it looks like um, as it's tightened. One other thing that seems to help with pressure, and if you've been able to notice on these, is they look very orange, is actually putting Ioban on the skin first and then poking your holes through. I've done it sometimes, and I haven't done it on others. I haven't found a major difference, but maybe for these smaller areas of pressure necrosis, it does help a little bit alleviate the pressure, but not enough that I've really noticed. The only thing it does help with is that if I want to just do the wound back change and go and just do the move maneuver and tightening, and I'm not gonna be trying to sneak back in and look check at any bowel, then you can just cut around the edge of the sponge, pop that out, place one in, and you've still got a good seal around the edges, and it's a way to go in and out really fast. So that's pretty helpful, um, because once you start having the seal get loose, and you're by the holes of the elastomer, you're by the ostomy, it's really hard to get a good seal, and you gotta take everything off and try to work around it. So it's the, the quickest, easiest thing is you get a really good seal with the Ioban first, and then just trim anything that's loose and keep doing the, the wound back changes in that way. So when do you wanna close? This is one of the patients where the ostomy's on that side. This is a, uh, at a two days before the one on, the, 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 on your right side. And you can just see how much more the skin has been able to reach and get closed along with that than how quickly the abdomen is. So generally what I'm looking at is when I'm going inside, am I still getting a good advancement? Normally the first few times you're doing your advancements, you'll see you'll go from like a 20 to like an 11 centimeter defect. It's the first time you put it in, it's actually pretty good for how quickly it closed. 
And then you're kind of like, okay, now I got two centimeters. Now it's maybe one centimeter. And then you're like, now I'm at five millimeters. Like I'm not really getting much more closure. Uh, it's at that point, if you're not really getting much more closure, you got to see, is it close enough that I can close it? For me, if I haven't done a separation, as long as I'm within about 10 centimeters, then I'm definitely going to just do my separation and close it. Um, if I've already done the separation, well, I better make sure I'm going to be able to, it's pretty close so that when I just tighten it, it's going to be good. And for all those guys, again, their fascia is normally crap, so then I'll put an underlay and an overlay. They get everything because you don't want to go back in their belly again because you've used everything you can use. So that tends to be why I do it. So this is a patient that was pretty much ready to be closed. This is that guy from, this is the guy from the beginning with that big abscess that we were looking at where his bowel was all out and you saw that. It's all better, it's got that weird shine on the bowel. You can barely tell that bowel looks almost just like something covering it. That's the, the capsule that forms around it. And basically when I, you can see the skin's already pretty much ready to get closed. And when I went inside, the fascia was almost ready to be closed. So it was close enough that if you just put it together, it wasn't going to rip apart or anything. Um, and that took about two weeks to do it. But you can start even seeing here, again, little pressure necrosis from the buttons. It's always a, it's normally around the top or where the most of the pressure was for him because there's a lot of defect lower. And you can see those marks on those sides. If it's just superficial, that'll all take care of itself. You don't need to worry about it. If the fat's died underneath, it'll kind of liquefy and just pack it, and that actually heals pretty fast once they've been closed. So there's these what I call off-label uses. Um, what do you do in a patient like this guy that I showed you who's just a sack of bowel? He has heterotopic ossification. He's missing his rectus muscle on the right side. It's been dehissed. It's up somewhere else. It's way too big a defect for me to just want to be able to close primarily. The bowel does not want to go back inside. I'm going to need to worry about domain loss. Well, the, abs the abra can still be used to help bring it together a little bit and at least temporize it for getting the, to kind of shove it back in, get the domain issues taken care of, and use a combination of stuff. So for him, it doesn't look super awesome because he had also had four enterotomies and a liver lack, um, and he was had an E. coli infection, which ended up, uh, requiring me to put peroxide inside the drains, which was great, but it worked. Um, is the right side, we got the, after we were done with the Abra, able to get the right rectus back to the pelvis. Then the left rectus, I actually put down on itself and did a VRAM because the low, to reconstruct the lower abdomen so that he actually had muscle all covering the lower abdomen. And that little triangle up top is a stratus and tiger mesh combo that over a few more washouts that I was doing, I tightened up to be about a two by three centimeter de defect of muscle, but still had mesh over it and no bowel was exposed. Um, I chose to do it this way because again, the more of the pressure is down at the lower part of the abdomen and I, he had a large defect there, but I was still after two weeks able to get it down to here. It took about another three weeks to get all the infections and everything cleared, um, but he was able to get mostly closed at, at that point. I'll go back to him in a little bit. Again, with the issues that I talked about, um, skin necrosis, delayed skin healing, infections, fat necrosis, all these things happen. They're all little things. They're easy to deal with. Just have to know that if the staples are flowing there, just leave the staples. I'll take care of my staples. Don't take them out. I have them there for reasons that may be in my own head voodoo, but I like to just take care of my own wounds. Um, you can see kind of there's all this inflammation, but there's something covering all this stuff on the bottom, and that's all muscle that's been floating up and covering itself, um, and they stay closed in that way. So to go from this picture, which is our guy from there, to this where he's got a completely closed abdomen, that's the most recent CT because for him, besides having the E. coli, the um, ethabond ended up retaining the infection. So about nine months later, I did take him back to take out the ethabond at that time, we, the gallbladder was taken out too from a very lateral approach because going back inside that wall of anything, you never want to go back in him anymore. But he has no draining wounds. His abdomen is completely closed. There's no real residual hernia. And it's not the prettiest belly, but it is closed. He can walk around. He's working. He's doing well. So that's the end of Abracadabra. Questions? 
No, you know there is an adhe the, there is no adhesion between the bowel and the silicone. It, no, it forms a capsule, and there it never actually sticks to the bowel. Just forms a, a capsule around itself. It's more if the bowel sneaks up and starts sticking to the fascia that you got to worry about it. Or the idea is, well, now it's in a little ball of capsule. You think that the bowel would get twisted or something on inside, but it hasn't. So I don't. You see that same film form under biologic mesh. Yeah. When we've had to take the biologic mesh out, there's a nice line on top of the bowel. Yeah, and that's kind of what this is. And it seems to go away over time, but luckily there's only a one person that we really had to go back, <coughs> take a peek inside his bowel, because you really don't want to go back inside this if you ever have to again. Uh, great presentation. Um, I haven't used it ever, so I can talk about it based on some of our donor samples. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like uh, you know, it takes a while to get to the point of closure. Um, you're eventually putting in an underlay and overlay. You're still putting it in mesh. Well, I am, but they're biologics, and it's only the fascia is actually the muscle is reapproximated, so it's just giving it a chance to not have the bowel pushing up against the fragile repair. Got it. But uh, why? What do you think the benefit or lack of benefit might be in the patient who's sedentary, isn't a construction worker, doesn't need a lot of his own musculature, and just putting in a piece of biologic is going to be a rigid mesh? But now you've got the patient, you know, out of the ICU and going instead of 50 days later. Well, again, that says 50 days. Mine are normally less than two weeks or a week, a week to closure. So theirs was 50, and I don't know how that is, but... Um, but in that patient, I just... Yeah, so that would be fine. Big bridging and, right. You know. Well, for any of the patients, you know, that you have, for any of the hernias, why don't you just put a mesh in any of them? It's just in your own decision if you think that they, they're going to need it. Um, I mean, if you can get skin coverage over it and you get a good mesh inside, then that's fine. It's, it's more for the ones that And you just are, use a uh, biologic, you know, sometimes you use, you know, a <coughs> mesh and then use a biologic to bridge the gap between the fascia. And any of those options, what I'm, what I'm thinking here is that it does take every three days to go back to the old, it's been a long time. There is a lot of time involved. Right. And I'm wondering, in your mind, when do you decide what patient benefits from that or the other one that just put in the bridging mesh, whatever it might be? Well, for me, I, I don't use bridging mesh. Like, I will get fascial closure. That's my, my thing. If I can't get fascial closure, I let you guys know. But my, so far, I try to do everything I can to get fascial closure. Um, and that's the only reason they're, they're coming to me for that. Um, but if you're not planning on getting fascial closure, you're just treating them like any normal hernia like you did, then that's fine. It's if you want to get fascial closure for whatever reason, or also, I mean, there's no skin. For all these guys, their skin's out to here anyway. And if your option is you're going to have a skin graft, and they're, they're, well, number one, that they're stable enough that they can actually go and they've got time <coughs> where they're not going to be dying. You don't want them out of the ICU. I mean, these guys don't have to be in the ICU with this either. Um, they can be on the floor. My guys have been on the floor. There's a theoretic chance of evisceration. My guys aren't running around doing jumping jacks. They have popped a few elastomers here and there, but there's so many in there that with the vac and everything else, it's pretty stable. Um, so if it's a patient that you think it's fine, I don't need to get closure with that. I'm fine with just a mesh because they're, they're not going to care, then that's perfectly fine. It's for one of the ones where it's more you can't even get the bowel inside. Mesh isn't going to be great. Once you do get the mesh in, you don't have any skin coverage. You're going to be looking at a skin graft type thing. So you mentioned from the theory, you can tighten them at that side. Yeah. So out of your seven, how many? I have never, well, let's just, well, I don't know how to politically say this, but I'm not so good at getting people to let me use uh, bedside sedation. So. All of them went to the yeah. So you would need bedside sedation in the ICU if you were going to do it. So I just run back to the OR and do it at the end of the day. Um, but in theory, you can, well, you know, as you're tightening it, because they, they're going to be fighting and stuff. And one of the things for those of you who are going to be doing it, because you're like, okay, that's a waste of OR time. It's a wound back change. You're getting like 50 bucks. If you are actually sneaking in, going around, looking under the silicone, and actually re-looking at the bowel and doing things with it and making sure hey, I want to just check that anastomosis while it's still there, that still counts as actually a re-exploration of a recently opened laparotomy. So if you're concerned that you're not utilizing your time, you can code it as that. I rarely do that unless I'm looking specifically at an anastomosis that I had a question about 
um, or there's something else going on. But for those of you who would be doing everything together, you can still use that, and that's actually a good code. So then you don't have to worry about, oh, I'm wasting an hour of OR time for a 15-minute procedure. Well, no, you make it a little bit more and actually check everything and make sure that everything's okay, and then it makes it a little bit more for the hospital to understand it. Yeah, I enjoy that presentation. I've used this a handful of times myself. The, the biggest uh, problem I wrestle with is in the non-paralyzed patient. I see the patient is perfectly capable of breathing for okay. themselves, and now mm -hmm. you put this huge corset on their abdominal wall. Mm -hmm. So I've seen the, the elastomers cut through the posterior sheath right. and the fascia as they are literally well, then, fighting the, the tightening. And so I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile who, who would you rather just leave paralyzed on the ventilator, exposing the ventilator to right. problems? Or who do you let well, so far, none of my patients have been paralyzed. <coughs> um, they all are um, maybe overnight if they were one of the other ones, but the next day they've been extubated. Even ones I've tried not to get extubated have been extubated. Um, but, and it does kind of, it, I've only found it when it's been crappy fascia that it's really been cutting through. And if you haven't been far enough back, um, for the edges and how tight and aggressive you are. If, um, in those, sometimes I won't quite tighten as hard if I don't trust the fascia as well. Um, but even those areas, <coughs> it, it tends to be okay because it's in an area we should have two layers of fascia anyway. So even if it's tearing on one, by the time everything is released, that, that whole inside is going to be compared to this hole out here. It's not going to, it's going to end up healing and closing. And then the underlay goes under that too. So um, I haven't found anybody that's cut more than like a couple millimeters, if that. So maybe it's just, because you do it at the VA, right? Or, oh no, oh upstairs. I, I know someone doing it at the VA, but I'm like, maybe it's just the way the, the patient's fascia is. Or maybe how it's, because if it's not directly perpendicular through it, I found that it skives more too. So I really have to be on my residents to make sure we are straight through perpendicular so that you're going this way instead if you've skived like this, now you're only fighting one way. Probably because of this device, you haven't had to keep people paralyzed. Right, well, none of mine are ever paralyzed. Well, we, you so. know, in our series, I probably had about three that had a remain paralyzed and on a ventilator. Yeah. I have had one that I've closed all the way without Abra that stayed for about a week on the ventilator for her own personal reasons. I don't know. She just didn't want to breathe on her own because her pressure was 40. She was fine, but um, she did not want to breathe for a week. Yeah, well, if you got an x-ray of her, the lungs are probably up in her neck. Yeah, well, her, her torso was about this big, you know, so <laughs> that didn't help. The, well, the whole story of this repair and everything has to do with mesh. Mm -hmm. And the mesh that we had initially was Marlex where the bowel grew into it. Uh, we had Vipro, which didn't stay around very long. Uh, we didn't have wound backs, and so the dressing changes a lot of times resulted in fistulas. We were happy to get Gore-Tex, which you saw here, mm -hmm. and it was treated so that one side wouldn't stick to the bowel. The only problem is, is that we didn't realize at the time it was going to be difficult because it wasn't porous. And so we had a lot of fluid collection. Not all of them developed an abscess, yeah. and probably half of them were treated with percutaneous drainage and mm -hmm. had resolution. But still, it, it was an advantage, and now we're pretty happy to have a nice porous mesh that we can deal with, not to mention biologic. So Any other questions? Any yeah. recurrence so far? Or? Well, it's only been three years, so no, but we'll see. It's, it's hard when it's early on. Um, so far, for even my general separations, I've gotten um, two recurrences total just for all the abdominal closures. And of course, we always found a way to blame the patient. But um, now they're they're better. So considering that over, I don't know how many hundred I've done now, it's not that high a result. So, so if anyone wants to play, we have the little buttons. You can see how they stick. And then, because the hardest part is actually getting these little guys fast back up and to get inside and actually figure out how you want to hold it. That can be a limiting thing if you're by yourself. It's kind of easy once you get it, but something to play with. All right, thank you very much.